Okay. Come on in. We're just about ready to start. I'd like to welcome everyone here today for our Waterloo uh, Institute for Health Informatics Research Seminar. Uh, it is my pleasure to have Dr. Ed Jernigan as our speaker today. Uh, Mahir Shanuta will introduce our speaker in just a, a few moments. But before we do that, I, would, I have a few uh, announcements, some commercials that I have to, uh, I guess, bore you with. And as well to note to uh, the audience here that this uh, seminar is being recorded and broadcast over the web. We would appreciate if you could hold your questions to the end of Ed's presentation because we would like to get a mic to you so that we can record your question and uh, have that on the video uh, recording and available to the web audience as well. So welcome everyone. Uh, a little while ago I was speaking to Ed, I guess over lunch, and I thought that what he was doing is so inspirational on our campus. He has led so many different uh, creative ways of engaging with our students from Chad Valley uh, and other things. Uh, and what he's working in is an, is an area that is very close to what we need as health informaticians in trying to integrate knowledge for our healthcare system. So I thought this is a great opportunity for us to have Ed speak to, about his work in educating solution integrators. So I'm very pleased that he's, he's with us today, here with us today. Uh, in terms of our upcoming events, I would like to uh, let people know that we are holding another health informatics boot camp at the end of June. Registration is open. It will, uh, the June boot camp will be held here, right next door in room 1302, from Sunday, June 27th to Tuesday, June 29th. Um, so I hope people will start to register for that boot camp. Uh, as always, it's a very uh, great way of uh, learning more and understanding what health informatics is all about. We are also holding the first ever Advances in Health Informatics Conference, which will be held at the Health Sciences Campus at the School of Pharmacy in Kitchener from April 28th to the 30th. Registration has just opened for that as well. Uh, it's a peer-reviewed conference. And uh, it's also very innovative in that it, we are trying to be green. Uh, we will have an on-site audience as well as webcast audience. So uh, I hope that you will consider coming to that conference. Again, it's April 28th to the 30th uh, of this year. The next uh, 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 research seminar will be uh, uh, called the Intelligent Senior Independent Living Spaces Project. It will be given by Mr. Shaki Fahal, who is the CEO of the J, uh, JG Group, as, as well as Dr. Robert Rosehart, Rosehart, who is the past president and vice chancellor of Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, ICELS, which is the acronym for this project, is a very in, uh, innovative concept on how we can provide a better living environment for those that are not very enabled or indeed are uh, entering their senior years. So I hope you will come to that seminar, which will be held on Tuesday, March 16th, in this room. And I think, without any further ado, I'd like to turn over the, uh, the mic to Maher to introduce our speaker. Um, good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Uh, it is really my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Ed Jernigan. He is a professor and director of the Center for Knowledge Integration at the University of Waterloo. He is also a professor and former chair of system design engineering. Ed is a dedicated teacher. He has been recognized with both the university's distinguished teacher award and the teaching excellence award of the faculty of engineering. Since 1984, he has served as the program director for the Shad Valley summer enrichment program, living in residence with 48 high school students during the month of July. Uh, in 2004, he created a university-wide enrichment program for high school students of exceptional potential, Waterloo Unlimited, which he, he continues to direct. In September 2008, he launched a new undergraduate degree program at the University of Waterloo, Bachelor of Knowledge Integration. Uh, today, Ed will talk about in educating solution integrators. Welcome, Ed. Uh, thanks very much. Um, 
Uh, it's interesting to listen to somebody talk about what you've been doing for a long time. I feel like I've been around a long time. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to have <coughs> in uh, the audience today uh, Scott Sloka, who was a high school student in the very first ever Shad Valley program that I participated in back in 1984. Um, so uh, I guess this is a kind of a full circle sort of talk since Scott is uh, actually a, a, a doctor, double doctor actually. He has a PhD in uh, systems design engineering and a doctor of medicine and he's a practicing urologist at the Grand River Hospital now. So I thought he'd be particularly valuable to have here to be uh, well, to keep me honest and to contribute to our conversation. Uh, I have somebody else that I'll introduce a little bit later on, but I um, uh, have been told by um, my sort of public speaking coach that I'm supposed to give my audience a sense of where I'm going, and so I've done that. This is as high tech as this talk is going to get. Um, it was a, a, a significant adjustment for me to make the transition from blackboard to whiteboard, but I did bring my own uh, marker there. Uh, my intent is to spend a little bit of time talking about what I think knowledge integration is and use that as the context for the rest of the talk. And then I want to talk to you about how and why the Bachelor of Knowledge Integration, this new degree program that is the focus of the Center for Knowledge Integration, came into being. And that story actually began back with uh, the SHAD program in 1984 when uh, Scott was about 17 years old at the time. Um, <coughs> the nature of the program and what it is we're trying to do by way of uh, knowledge integrators education and ultimately what the knowledge integrator student skill set is on graduation at least what we expect our first graduating class won't be until 2012 so we're not quite there, there yet um, but then um, talk a little bit open up the discussion to the relevance of knowledge integration and solution integrators to the problems that uh, you know more about than I do in the world of health informatics. So what is knowledge integration? For me, uh, I like to think about it in terms of this sort of uh, knowledge hierarchy that you're probably familiar with, the notion of data and information and knowledge and wisdom. And as you go from data to information, you need to sort of bring in context, whether you're talking about Bateson's sense of uh, uh, information as the difference that makes a difference. Uh, raw data is, you know, facts about the world or things that are a little bit different that you want to observe. But the question is, what differences are really important? What differences make a difference? Whether you're going to use that context or whether you use Shannon's context of the information associated with events that are kind of unexpected, unlikely to occur, and use probability measures to, to get at information. It's all about providing that context that moves you from data to information. And to make the next step from information to knowledge, you begin to sort of draw on connections. How is that particular set of information sort of connected to the rest of the world? And those connections are really what give you the sort of knowledge framework that gives you some sense of understanding of your world. And to move from knowledge to wisdom, in some sense, you really have to add in the sort of into the mix experience with the world. And that experience sort of takes your connections that give you your knowledge framework and puts it in your broader life experience and the sort of experience that you have in sort of in encountering and dealing with problems. The sense of wisdom really adds the notions of vision and design to the kind of fundamental knowledge framework that you start with. Um, now you can talk about that data, information, knowledge, wisdom framework within the context of a particular discipline. But of course, what we're interested in in the world of knowledge integration is sort of enriching that set of connections so it goes beyond the boundaries of a particular discipline and draws on other relevant disciplines for the particular world that you want to have some um, uh, understanding of and make a difference in. And that notion of forming a synthesis that transcends boundaries of disciplines, that sort of bridges different domains of expertise, that's what I mean by talking about knowledge integration. So we want to kind of enrich the connective framework of our knowledge, our understanding of patterns of information in the world across disciplinary boundaries and then apply that to the broader experience that allows us, we hope, to give us the sort of wisdom to address 
the problems that we face in this complex and rapidly changing world. So that's what KI is. Now, the how and why of BKI, I think that's, well, it's fun for me to talk about because I've been living it for at least 34 years now. Um, my education is all in electrical engineering. I have three degrees in electrical engineering from MIT, and that kind of, I think, qualifies me, at least in the public eye, as an expert in electrical engineering. If you're not an expert in electrical engineering with three degrees from MIT, well, what else are you? Well, I also like to say, well, yeah, I went to MIT, but I'm not like that. In fact, most people who went to MIT would probably not be like what the kind of common prototype is of, of the MIT grad, right? What's, the, what's your sort of prototype or your notion uh, of the MIT grad? Well, it's sort of some sort of uber nerd, I suppose. Um, but in fact, and I'm particularly sensitive to this because I spent most of my career as an educator in the world of engineering in Canada, the engineering education in Canada is much more specialized and much less sort of general than the education that uh, uh, you get in the program, the, my undergraduate program at MIT, where in fact a quarter of my courses were in the arts and, and humanities, and three quarters of my courses were in the world of applied science. Um, so I was sort of predisposed to pay attention to things like economics and uh, psychology and language and literature and English all of which was part of my undergraduate program at MIT. And in my graduate program, I minored in psychology, and I did a degree that was sort of biomedically applied. So from early on, I was starting to sort of try to connect my knowledge of engineering to the broader world in which I was trying to operate. I came to a systems design engineering at the University of Waterloo because it looked to me like exactly this, that sort of a place. I like to define systems design engineering to people who are less familiar with what it's all about by talking about, well, look, systems design engineering is an education for students who are interested in engineering problem solving, but they're interested in working on problems that sort of transcend traditional boundaries in uh, disciplines within engineering. If you're going to have that kind of a capability, you need a framework for thinking that's not locked into a particular discipline. And systems thinking does that because a system can be, well, a system can be anything. You have inputs, you have outputs, you have a structure that allows you to sort of mathematically map from inputs to outputs. You can apply the power of systems thinking, systems theory to that. I tell my systems kids, systems is how you know the world. But if you're an engineer, you want to solve problems typically by creating new systems that interact with existing systems to make the world a little bit better. That process, that creative process in engineering, we call design. And systems design engineering has in its core a series of five sort of systems thinking course, how do you know the world, and five sort of design practice courses, how do you make that a difference. So systems is how we know the world, design is how we change the world, so that's fine. I expected to spend my whole career doing systems design engineering. And then a fellow by the name of George Sulis sort of seduced me during my first sabbatical in 83-84 into getting involved with the Shad Valley Summer Program. I think, since I know most of the people in the audience, most of you know what Shad is, for those of you who don't know about the Shad Program, Shad is kind of an unusual enrichment experience focused on technology and entrepreneurship for high school students. They come and they live on campus for a month during the month of July, and they get a pretty remarkable enrichment experience. Most of them describe it as life-changing. Um, this experience is kind of an extraordinary thing for an, an academic to get involved in because I actually move in residence and live with these uh, 48 hyperactive teenagers for the month of July. Um, turns out that this coming July will be my 25th year of running the Shad Valley program at this university. If you add all that up, you know, I spent 24 months living in residence. When my wife Kim and I were celebrating our 36th wedding anniversary last year, she said, no, 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 you only get credit for 34 years. For two years, you've been living with those kids, <laughs> right? Well, <clears throat> the thing about living with the, those bright, well-rounded high school kids for a long time, you get some sense of what motivates them, what interests them, what they're, what they're idealistic about, what they want to do with their lives, what they want to do when they go on to university. And of course, a lot of the reason why universities are supportive of outreach programs is they want to attract right, well-rounded students to their programs. 
And this was really reinforced back in 2003 when I was coming to the end of my term as chair in systems design, and I got a list of Millennium Scholars on campus in 2003. You remember the Millennium Scholarship Program? That was a federally uh, funded program that gave bright, well-rounded students, particularly engaged with their, with their communities, an opportunity, well, gave them a scholarship that they could take to any institution in the country. We had 52 Millennium Scholars that we were uh, hosting at a little bit of a celebration at the university that time across the entire university. At that time, I was curious. I wonder how many names I might recognize on that list of Millennium Scholars. It turned out that 12 of the 52 Millennium Scholars were systems kids, and 16 of the 52 Millennium Scholars were shads. Right? Now, that's pretty extraordinary. There's nothing else that popped up uh, with that kind of frequency. Um, in, uh, well, in, in any, uh, on any dimension. Shad and Systems were attracting bright, well-rounded students to this university. Well, I don't know if they're responsible for bringing them here, but at least we didn't scare them off. Uh, uh, far more than anything else that you could identify. So, of course, you have to brag to your boss about what a good job you are delivering on bringing the best of the best to the university. And you know what happens when you brag to your boss, right? Ahmed um, says, you've given me an opening. I've been wondering what to do with you. I know you're coming to the end of your term as chair. Would you champion a new kind of enrichment experience for the University of Waterloo? We responded with uh, something called Waterloo Unlimited. Waterloo Unlimited runs uh, enrichment programs um, during the school year for high school students at the grade 10, grade 11, and grade 12 level. Um, it's like SHAD, but it's broadened in scope and compressed in time. And the thing that's important for me to say to you about Unlimited, given what I want to do talking about knowledge integration, is to give you a sense of what the Unlimited experience is like. The Unlimited experience is designed around four kind of cornerstone principles. Transdisciplinary, intrinsic motivation, community, and self-enrichment. Most enrichment programs, if you, if you go and look, most enrichment programs available for, for high school students tend to be discipline specific. You can do, well, you can certainly do enrichment in math at the University of Waterloo, right? You can do enrichment in uh, physics at the Perimeter Institute. You can do enrichment in music, summer camps. You can do enrichment in any particular discipline. You can find a place that will give you enrichment. There's very few places where you can go and get enrichment for the whole person. Right? It's kind of like an outward bound for the broad range of scholarship and intellectual activity. Well, that's what we tried to do. Let's create an enrichment experience that transcends disciplinary boundaries by building them around themes. And I know some of you, Jeff is one, has given uh, sessions in the unlimited things. And Graham also, because you've done talks for us, we've run vision theme programs, we've run design theme programs, where we bring academics from disciplines right across the full spectrum to talk to the theme in the context of their discipline. And that gives the students an extraordinary notion of the university as this magical place where there are no silos that sort of partition disciplines apart from each other. Transdisciplinary. Intrinsic motivation. We want kids who are there, not because they're trying to get credits towards the degree program or because they need this particular thing on their resume. They're there because they are intrinsically motivated to explore ideas. Community. We want to give them a sense that they belong to the community that is the university, but also that give them a, an exposure to a, a peer group that they won't have in their homeschool environment. A whole bunch of people who think it's cool to talk about forensic optometry, let's say. Um, and finally, we wanted to give the students the notion of being in charge of their own education. The skills that we uh, run during the uh, afternoons of the unlimited program skill sessions are built on the notion of giving the students the uh, uh, strategies for enhancing their creativity, thinking critically, introducing themselves professionally, learning something by heart, uh, writing a killer one-page memo. Um, what do you do if the person at the front of the classroom is not the most entertaining pre uh, presenter, but you still need the information that they are trying to share with you? How do you turn things around? The very first unlimited program we ran was in the fall of 2004, right? November. And the next week, I got a phone call from a local teacher saying, Ed, I don't know what you did, but the kid I sent to you came up to me in the hallway. 
threw his arms around me and gave me a big hug and said, thank you for sending me to Unlimited. It changed my life. And that was a vision theme program, so I was pretty sure that the thing that was most life-changing for this student was the cool session that I did uh, on vision. <laughs> or maybe the session that Graham did on forensic optometry. Well, it turned out that was not really it. That was, those were cool things, but the thing that he saw really going to make an immediate difference and what motivated him to create the Unlimited Club for his high school were these skill sessions, because he saw that that was going to make an immediate difference. So, okay, we've been running along now for quite a while. I've spent a lot of my time engaged in enrichment with bright, well-rounded students, whether, whether it's in the Shad Summer Program or if it's during the school year with the Unlimited Program. And I thought, well, this is fantastic. There's a bit of an issue, however, in that when you talk to these sorts of students about what they're going to do later on or when they come back to you after they've gone off to university and they come back, you see a fair amount of disillusionment. You see a fair bit of kind of discouraged reaction. They get disappointed by the fact that when they have this sense of the university as this magical place where everybody there is intrinsically motivated and transcends disciplinary boundaries and has a strong sense of community and is empowered to take charge of their own education. And that's not the experience that they report when they come back from their first year program in, in many areas. And so I started thinking about, well, there's, there's an issue here. There's something, well, it's different running an enrichment program where you don't have to give them marks and pass and fail them from running an undergraduate degree program, yes. But why can't an undergraduate B degree program be a little more like the kind of life-changing experience that we see in these enrichment programs? And uh, that was back in the spirit of why not. You remember the sort of motto of the university at the time? Well, well, why not? Why can't you talk about an undergraduate degree program that's not so limited? Why is it that students coming out of high school have to choose among such a wide variety of specializations before they're prepared to? When I was an undergraduate at MIT, do you know how many undergraduate majors there were available to me? About 20. I think actually 21 undergraduate majors that you could have picked if you were a student at MIT at the time. Do you have any idea how many distinct undergraduate uh, majors there are that confront high school students when they apply to university? 984 distinct undergraduate majors at the University of Toronto to pick on our competition down the 401, right? Well, Waterloo is as guilty as anybody. Right? If you want to apply to engineering at the University of Waterloo, you've got to commit to engineering before you even know what engineering is, and you have to pick one of 12 different flavors of engineering. Right? How is a high school kid supposed to be able to do that? Why should a high school student have to do that? We see a lot of students in Unlimited and in Shad who are bright and well-rounded, and they don't want to give up half of their brain in order to meet the degree requirements of a particular undergraduate specialization. Not to mention the fact that this world is changing so rapidly that any particular specialty that you pick right now, there's a pretty good chance that five years from now that will be entirely obsolete. We saw this, Kim Boucher and I worked on engineering admissions for a while in the 90s, and there was a time about 1995 when we could have admitted 5,000 computer engineers to the University of Waterloo, right? They all wanted to be C++ programmers. That was, you know, that was going to be the ultimate career for them. Right? And you know what happened four or five years later. Right? The bubble burst and those jobs disappeared. Now they've kind of come back, but mostly they're in Southeast Asia. Right? It's dangerous to specialize too soon if the only reason you're specializing is that's because you, you want a job. If you're specializing because that's what you're passionate about, that's what you love to do, great. I have no, nothing against that. I have a daughter who's been passionate about writing since age 14 and she's focused on being a great writer, and that's fantastic. But I think society is ill-served if all we have are deep subject specialists, right? If all you know is what's really on the inside of your little silo, you're not going to be particularly well prepared to address those kind of problems that transcend disciplinary boundaries, the complex issues that arise in health informatics, in climate change, in global poverty in, well, you name the sort of outstanding problems of our times, 
and typically you'll discover that there are sorts of problems that require the perspectives of many different specialists. So we set out to create an undergraduate degree program that I started thinking in terms of as an unlimited undergraduate degree program built on those same kind of cornerstones of intrinsic motivation, transdisciplinarity, community, and self-enrichment, but translated into a university degree program context. And in 2008, we opened doors to our first class in the Bachelor of Knowledge Integration. It's an entirely new degree designation. We had to go to the province to get it approved. But we got record turnaround in that approval process six weeks after we submitted it, when the normal turnaround is six months time, we got a ringing endorsement from the ministry. And I later discovered that somebody in the ministry started doing a little bit of marketing for us. And I started hearing people come and ask me about KI because they had a friend who was in the ministry and said, you should check out this program. Mm -hmm. So, okay, knowledge integration, what is it? Our undergraduate program in knowledge integration and how do I think it's relevant to people who are trying to work in the world of health informatics? The idea is in some sense to push back against the extreme specialization that we've seen in particularly the North American uh, postgraduate environments, post-secondary uh, uh, education environment, uh, and kind of reinvent the classic notion of a university education. What is a university education supposed to do for you? It's supposed to fundamentally, I think, give you two things, a way of knowing your world and a way of engaging with your world. Right? Whether you're going to do it within the context of a particular discipline or whether you're going to do it much more broadly. You don't know what discipline you want to be in. You want a framework for knowing your world, a framework for making a difference. Systems design engineering, systems thinking for knowing the world, design practice for changing the world, I think that's a powerful education for an engineer. Well, okay, what if you were to take away the constraints of engineering and talk about an education that would really be designed for that student coming out of high school who doesn't want to specialize right away. They want that broad background right across the arts and sciences. They want immense flexibility once they discover what their areas of interest are. But you want some sort of backbone, some sort of glue that holds it all together. And that is a set of courses that we call our skills courses, what I think of as our skills courses for thinking and doing. Right? Knowing the world, changing the world in a way that transcends disciplinary boundaries. And if you look at the KI, the structure of uh, the uh, knowledge integration program, it's um, about a quarter of it are the core courses, which I'll get back to in a minute. A quarter of it are the breadth courses, which are a broad foundation across the arts and the sciences. Everybody does three sciences and two maths and a language and English and some philosophy and some um, statistics. So there's a broad spectrum that's part of your degree requirements. But that leaves 18 of the 40 courses are electives for you to pick your own areas of interest. So if you wanted to educate yourself to work in health informatics, you could spend about a quarter of your program in the sort of information technology world and a quarter of your program in the health sciences world. And you'd still, you'd have this sort of framework for interdisciplinary thinking and problem solving that comes out of the core. If you look at the core of the knowledge integration program, it is a kind of cycling of knowing about the world and then making a difference. And we, we use the sort of design framework as that, well, I think of design as applied knowledge integration, because what is design? Design is an approach to complex problem solving. If your problems are complex, they require multiple perspectives. If you're going to come up with an effective solution, you've got a, what we would call an integrated solution. You've got to sort of integrate that knowledge across the multiple experts around the table to come up with some new approach, new resolution to, to your problem. So our core program begins with an introduction to what knowledge integration is all about, the philosophy of understanding habits of mind across the disciplines, and an introduction to design. Paul Lacone and I teach a design and problem solving course where we really do explicitly address real world problems that require integration across disciplinary boundaries. In our second year course, uh, Katie here teaches our second year course, it's about the nature of knowledge and she brings in experts in the arts and the sciences and gives the students an introduction to the habits of mind in these different disciplines. What do questions look like? What do answers look like? How do you have an 
and engage conversation with experts across the arts and sciences. And in our third year course, it's a year-long design course focused on museums, it turns out. And our fourth year course is an opportunity to them, for them to do an integrative thesis on some problem that is built around their particular areas of concentration that they've built up in the, in the, with their elective program. So that's what the knowledge integration program looks like. Um, I'm mindful of the time and I wanted to leave some time for discussion of health informatics. So what I will do is uh, tend to wrap up my focus on knowledge integration at this point by identifying what I like to call as the knowledge integrator skill set. The four essential skills for success in the 21st century. And at this point when I'm talking to high school students, I say, wouldn't you want to know what those are? Right? And usually they'll, they'll tolerate my talking a little more about it and they'll say, okay, what are those four essential skills that I have to make sure that I have when I graduate, right? Regardless of, what, of whether I'm going to be a specialist or whether I'm going to be a generalist or whether I'm going to go on to law school or med school. And the knowledge integration framework, actually, if you look at it, is flexible enough to give students that entry into any sort of graduate program that they want once they sort of make up their mind what it is they're interested in. It doesn't give them an engineering degree, but just about anything else you can build into the knowledge integration framework. Um, so anyway, what are those skills? You need to be literate, but you also need to be numerate. Right? And if you look at uh, what's uh, currently evolved in the world of liberal arts, it used to be a liberal arts degree, you, you really add, did get an exposure to both qualitative and quantitative thinking in the world. Right? That's not so much true any longer a liberal arts degree, you typically don't get much in the world of quantitative thinking. So what we try to do in knowledge integration is make sure that they've got the qualitative framework and the quantitative framework. They're both literate and they're numerate. And if you have that understanding, you need to be able to communicate that effectively, so you need to be articulate. Literate, numerate, articulate, you need to know how to play well with others. That's the fourth critical skill, and that's probably the most important. And by play well with others, what I really mean is be able to collaborate effectively across boundaries. Whether we're talking geographic boundaries, or cultural boundaries, or ethnic boundaries, or disciplinary boundaries. If you can collaborate effectively across boundaries, and you are literate, numerate, and articulate, then you're ready to engage with and make a difference in the complex world, however it's going to look five years from now. You'll be prepared to sort of adapt. And that's what we try to do with the Knowledge Integration Program and uh, check back in about two years' time and take a look at our graduates and see what they're up to. And we'll see to what extent we have succeeded in turning out what a former student of mine by the name of Catherine Booth likes to call solution integrators. She's given a talk at SHAD a couple of times and what she's, um, I think she has degrees in, in systems design and management sciences from this university former uh, VP information technology for Loblaws. But she's come and talked to our students and she says, from her perspective, it's very easy for people at her position to be able to hire what she calls deep subject specialists. We turn out a lot of deep subject specialists. Their real challenge and what their organization struggles with is trying to find people who are effective solution integrators. And that was her term. And I use that for the title of this talk because I think KI students are uniquely well prepared to be solution integrators. They're prepared to engage with experts from the sciences. They're prepared to engage with experts from the humanities, right? They know how to bridge the arts and sciences. They know how to bridge the humanists with the scientist's perspective. They know how to talk to both the artist and the engineer. We have one over here in the hallway. Um, in, in the, in the real, uh, Rob. Um, they ought to be able to sit down to uh, engage in a conversation with a healthcare provider and an information technologist and a computer scientist. And that ought to give you the framework for addressing the kinds of issues that you presumably are concerned with in the world of health informatics. Now, um, when Shirley asked me to do this talk, uh, to come and talk about KI and its application to health informatics, 
I said, well, I'm not sure I'm the right person to do that because I don't feel like I'm that engaged with health informatics. I'm really engaged with knowledge integration. I have, over the course of my career, been quite interested in the world of image processing and pattern recognition, both of which I think are critical skill sets for the world of uh, uh, medical problem solving and health informatics. Um, uh, in fact, I've done work on uh, uh, medical imaging for diagnosis. Uh, I've done work on content-based image retrieval, which I think is also a relevant problem when you're talking about large image databases with different image modalities that you encounter in the practice of medicine. Um, but she twisted my arm enough that I agreed to, well, okay. But then it turns out that if you're around long enough, and I've been here 34 years now, um, turns out that there's all kinds of great students that you used to work with who are off doing exactly this kind of a thing. And I was able to uh, persuade Danny Ho, who's a PhD at the University of Maryland in Baltimore, and works on uh, human factors and um, um, uh, medical applications. And Scott Sloka, who is a neurologist at the Grand River Hospital, who has a background in uh, computer imaging, is PhD. He did jointly with Claude Namias at McMaster's medical imaging group, right? and Waterloo Systems Design Engineering. And he also has the, I had mentioned earlier, um, goes back to the early days of SHAD. Um, so I have some real live practicing uh, health informatics experts to help out here. And I thought if uh, we opened it up to questions at this point, maybe they can help answer some of these questions. So I'll stop there. All right, well thank you very much. That's very interesting. I'm sure that uh, uh, many of you have uh, questions, but I want to kick off uh, some questions before we start. And uh, because uh, Dominic Covey, who is uh, essential to these uh, research seminars, couldn't unfortunately be here today, but he did send um, uh, some questions. And uh, uh, you've touched on, I, I think, almost every question that he was going to ask you uh, in your commentary already. Um, and maybe just a clarification on a couple things, but also just to emphasize that um, he's thinking exactly like you're thinking. Um, you use the, the term knowledge integration. How is that different from the concept of transdisciplinary thinking? Or is it? Um, I think that they're part and parcel of the same thing. I think that when we set out to design knowledge integration, we were looking for a transdisciplinary education. And we were looking for a name that would be distinctive and compelling that would identify the program. Bachelors of transdisciplinary education didn't really cut it so well. Um, just the Bachelor of Arts and Science, which implies the interdisciplinarity across the arts and sciences, would have uh, then put us in the problem of trying to distinguish ourselves from conventional arts and sciences programs where you have to do some arts and you have to do some sciences, but it's essentially a surf and turf kind of a degree. It's up to you to make them sort of fit on the same plate. And we wanted to say, look, we explicitly address this notion of building bridges across the disciplines and being able to transcend disciplines. So knowledge integration really is part of how you transcend disciplinary boundaries. So transdisciplinary thinking, I think, and knowledge integration mean the same thing in that context. Yeah, he says that uh, he quite, quite often describes it as having one brain capable of thinking in multiple disciplines. Or so. what, uh, um, what's his name from Rotman calls um, the opposable mind, the integrative thinking. Mm -hmm. Roger Martin, right? And uh, just going on uh, on your essential skills for uh, KI, people in KI, uh, he says that we often talk about our students becoming thinkers, but also uh, often nothing is talked. Uh, taught in most of our programs regarding structured thinking or formal cognitive processes. We even have basic stuff available like the, that is taught by De Bono in his uh, mm -hmm. book, Teaching Thinking. Is teaching thinking something that you view as very important? And I think from your talk, uh, you have said it's that. Clearly, actually, we have just uh, are running this term, our first elective in knowledge integration, which is a creative thinking course. And I know Linda Carson, who teaches it, is a big fan of De Bono. Um, and uh, we also have built into the core program critical thinking. 
And for me, education is really as this sort of balancing of thinking and doing. You've got to bridge that thinking and doing gap if you're going to be an effective solution integrator. And then uh, going on into the doing, uh, he, he says, uh, I, I could say the same thing about collaboration. And you fi finished with uh, your, uh, uh, some comments about collaboration and how important it is. He says that he has about 10 books on that topic, but few programs teach collaboration as a formal structured topic. And he also says that he sees this as being a science and a discipline. So um, any further comment on the importance of collaboration? No, I mean, uh, uh, because so much of our core program is built around the doing, the design process part. We have our students constantly working in groups of different sizes and shapes so that they have a lot of practice at this collaboration. Um, it's, uh, well, it's one of our four mm -hmm. sort of criteria for yes. a successful uh, uh, program. Right. They need to be able to collaborate effectively. Now, um, I think collaboration, like design for that matter, is one of those things that you learn by doing it as opposed to listening to how it's supposed to be done. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot harder in the doing than it is reading about it. So with that, I'll turn the, uh, uh, the mics over to the audience. Uh, any questions? There's one on this side. Where is it? Right there in the top. Okay. And I uh, totally agree with your four skills, not a problem with that. I'd just like to know a little bit more about how you're going to assess those in the context of the program so that you can be assured that people have a certain level of numeracy, <laughs> literacy. Uh, by, by being articulate, I assume mean they can communicate what they have read and also mm -hmm. created themselves. Uh, well, there's two, a couple of answers to that. One is uh, through their formal <coughs> passing, uh, you know, clearing the hurdles with respect to the courses in mathematics and language and so on that we require, which we, you know, our operational definition of numeracy is you've got some exposure to university mathematics, right? And you've got some exposure to university level statistics. And if you have that, that's a sort of reasonable definition of numeracy. If you've got um, uh, exposure to university level communications courses, public speaking and, and English writing, and you've got an exposure to two courses in another language. That's sort of our working definition of literacy. But the real sort of uh, proof and the sort of the student's portfolio that will demonstrate that they have these, sk these skills will be in the actual uh, projects that they have will have done over the course of the core program, whether they're design projects in first year or their museum design project in third year or their integrative uh, uh, thesis, uh, theses that they write in their fourth year. So their performance in the core is going to be dependent on their being able to demonstrate those, that particular skill set. Jeff. Here's, uh, We'll get you. Yes. I have a question from someone on the web. Okay. In KI program, the third year is going to be a whole year design. That is not like a course design project when you take a common course. So, how student how do students pick up the project? Will teachers give the topic to the students? How do the teachers evaluate the students' projects? Okay, I'll talk to that a little bit, but I happen to have in the room uh, Professor Rob Gorbett, who's going to be doing that course for the first time. So my answers are speculative rather than um, retrospective. Uh, the, uh, the, no the notion of the museum course is not that we want to train them to be museologists, but the museum is a place where you can go to learn cool stuff about things. Right? The museum is, in some sense, the public face of knowledge and public face of scholarship. So um, uh, Linda's inspiration for this sort of focus for this year-long design project was to say, well, let's immerse them in what museums are all about. And then let's give them a design challenge. You form a particular group, an independent group, and I don't know that we've decided yet whether we're going to assign them to a group or whether we're going to let them self-select a group. But then you pick a topic and you pick an audience and you spend the year figuring out exactly how to best create the museum experience or the museum exhibit around that topic for that audience. And at the end of the year, 
will actually have it built and put up in a gallery someplace so that the world can come and see what the knowledge integration students have created for the KI Museum for that particular year. The, um, how do we get them started in that? Well, we're going to take them to a museum-rich city for two weeks. Our first class, Eric's class over there, Eric, or Eric also is one of our, the earliest members of the Unlimited community, so I've got uh, a good sampling of my last 34 years in the room here. Um, the, uh, we're going to take the whole class to Amsterdam for two weeks, April 25th to May 10th. And what we're going to do there is say, look, you've got two weeks and there's an incredible amount of extraordinary variety of museums in, in this uh, community of Amsterdam. Spend, I think the ex expectation will be that they will have done 10 case studies on museums over the course of their two weeks there. What works, what doesn't work, what would you do differently, what do you think about it? So they'll have some raw material, some real first-hand experience of the museum uh, as the sort of substrate. And then they'll come back and Rob is putting together the course that will talk to them about what museums are all about, where they came from, where they might go, what is a museum, how is it to be designed, and then their major project will be a design project over the course of that term. How do we evaluate it? The way you evaluate any and all design projects. You look at how well they've defined their problem and how well they've laid out their criteria, how well they've executed their, their own plan, and how successful it is at meeting the goals that they've set out for themselves. Is that more or less what we plan to do, Rob? That's good. You're, you can stay. Uh, who's next? Rob, Jeff. Um, we're all used to uh, <clears throat> the notion that the name of your degree kind of leads to a job. So computer science students become computer programmers and engineers become professional engineers. So I'm, I'm wondering what the expectation is for, like what sort of jobs would you expect a KI student to get? I mean, if... I love that question because I get asked that question more than any single question, as you might expect, particularly when the economy is bad and parents are worried about what their students are going to do when they finish and so on. I have a lot of experience answering, with that, uh, answering that sort of question because I've been working with systems design engineering for 34 years. How do systems design engineers answer that question? What is a systems design engineer? Right? Well, that's kind of an interesting thing. But if you can get them to sort of step back from it and say, hey, but wait a minute. Systems design engineering can prepare you for an incredibly wide variety of uh, experiences in the world of engineering. And in fact, I mean, I'll get back to knowledge integration in a minute, but I want to just sort of draw you the, the parallel to that model. Because if you go into the engineering, main engineering building, Carl Pollock Hall, and you go and you look at the hallway for the Alumni Achievement Award winners in the Faculty of Engineering, every year the Faculty of Engineering identifies three distinguished alumni to recognize. And so, I wonder how many of those are systems design grants? Well, first of all, you have to recognize that systems got, gave everybody else a 10-year head start. The systems first graduating class was in 1974. First graduating class in engineering was 1965. So we've got a 10-year handicap. That means our alumni are also much younger, right? Who are your distinguished alumni? Usually the old guys, right? Because they've got the track record. But one, out, and also, the, fact, the Department of Systems Design and Engineering accounts for 7% of the alumni of the faculty. And yet, it accounts for close to a quarter of the Alumni Achievement Award winners. So what do systems design engineers do when they graduate? They're successful at whatever they want. Right? They go on to medicine. They go on to um, the, uh, the chief... Uh, the founder and chief technology officer of Angstrom Power on the West Coast is a systems design grad. Uh, the chief operating officer of Amazon.com is a systems design grad. The most frequent degree, if you pop up, if you do a sort of um, histogram of backgrounds for project managers in Microsoft, in Redmond, systems design engineers. They have the skills for thinking across boundaries. They have the skills for working collaborating effectively with an interdisciplinary group to be remarkably successful by that objective external measure, right? I think 
that 10 years from now, when you say, what will a knowledge integration student be able to do? You'll, I'll be able to point to an incredibly rich spectrum of accomplishment of knowledge integrators. Because after all, what they're going to wind up doing depends a lot on what they do in the program. Right? Don't come to the Bachelor of Knowledge Integration program if you want training for a specific kind of career. But if you want an education that will prepare you for a wide range of opportunities in careers, knowledge integration can prepare you for pretty much any kind of grad school you want to do if you choose your electives appropriately. It's actually very easy to get a double major in knowledge integration and a specialization. And we actually see many of our students who are what Linda calls uh, spiky profiled students. They're very strong in one area, but they don't want to abandon everything else. And so they're doing the sort of top of the line computer science courses because they want to do that, but they don't want to do only that. We also have students who are broad right across the board and they're just not ready to specialize yet and they want to maintain a high level of activity across the arts and sciences. Maybe that sort of a student is preparing for med school or law school or teaching or business. So if they want to converge on a particular discipline, well, they'll discover that and they'll be, begin to put together a profile to do that. But they will also be solution integrators. They'll be the sort of people that Catherine Booth and um, Kevin Salvadori, Canada's top 40 under 40 and VP for TELUS in Vancouver and a systems grad, by the way, says um, exactly the sort of people that they're trying to recruit to be project managers in their organization, to be the interdisciplinary problem solvers in their organization. If you look at big organizations these days, they need people who can effectively integrate across departments in the organization in order to come up with novel solutions to problems that the discipline and the, the disciplined thinkers, well, knowledge integrators, undisciplined thinkers, right? <laughs> now, <laughs> the discipline specific or the domain specific expertise may not think about because they're not holding those different versions of reality in their mind at the same time. So that's a long-winded answer, but it does tend to get me kind of excited because <laughs> I think, well, let me turn the question around. How many people are doing when they graduate the job they thought they were going to get educated for when they left high school? Not very many. I would wager. Certainly I'm not. When I went into high school, I was going to be a chemical engineer because I did AP chemistry and I got the best AP chemistry mark in the history of my school. But then on the way to MIT, on the flight, I, re I realized that I just placed out a first year chemistry and I never had to catch chemistry again in my whole career if I didn't want to. So I got distracted by other things. I think that's a pretty common experience. Uh, I've got a web, several web questions here. There are tremendously interesting problems in health informatics. Would you consider an introductory health informatics course to stimulate students to tackle challenges in this area? Well, there's always this trade-off, right? Um, I would consider all kinds of things that I could put into the core, right? But the more I put into the core, the less flexibility that I give my students, right? And I'm not trying to educate health informatics students. I would encourage people who are doing knowledge integration to maybe think to move towards health informatics by choosing their electives correspondingly. But if I were to try to put in a core course on every important transdisciplinary area that I could imagine, we wouldn't have room for any flexibility in the program at all. So, I would encourage students to think of KI students to think about health informatics as a as a career choice, but I'm not really willing to say, yeah, I put an HI course in the core. What do you think about that? <laughs> Most of our department is here, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that health informatics would be a great sort of case study of KI, and so. You, got, you can give me a couple of speakers, I'll put them into the KI seminar series. One of the things that's extraordinary about our undergraduate program is that every Friday afternoon we have the KI seminar series and we bring in speakers who have experience out there in the real world of collaboration across boundaries to come and be effectively role models for the KI students. And although it's a Friday afternoon optional seminar, three quarters of our undergraduate students are there every Friday. Mm. 
We give them cookies, so maybe that's it. <laughs> for doctors. Right. Um, I, no, I think that's an excellent idea. We'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, to me, knowledge integration is uh, crucial to health informatics. I'm sure you would agree, your students would agree that you've brought here today that without that knowledge integration and collaboration, um, there are so many complex problems in health informatics, uh, we won't be able to solve them. So uh, you were going to make a comment. Sorry. Can you give the opportunity to ask a question? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. So a discipline has cohesiveness usually because there's a theoretical foundation. And you mentioned a philosophy for knowledge integration. Um, are there any theoretical foundations which um, also has that cohesiveness for the department or uh, program? Um, well, I think I would turn to our philosophers and say, in some sense, knowledge integration is, a, is an applied uh, philosophy program. And you'll see that reflected in the amount of philosophy. In fact. One out of four faculty members in the Center for Knowledge Integration happens to be a card-carrying philosopher. Um, uh, but to the extent that, well, I guess the other sort of underlying philosophy of what we're trying to do, while well, philosophy and uh, the sort of epistemology and knowledge in that sense is, is one way of looking at it, the other sort of theoretical construct, it's not really a theoretical construct, it's more a practical construct, and that is the construct of design thinking. And our whole sort of approach to engaging with the world is built around this notion of design thinking that you can read more about in Change by Design, the um, Tim Brown book that came out just this past year. So if you put together design thinking as manifest in the leading design places like Ideal, together with kind of applied epistemology and the nature of knowledge, you've kind of got the construct that knowledge integration is built around. Is that good enough? There's another question from the web. Um, uh, discussion. Okay. Discussion. Well, go for it. We're almost out of time. Yeah. Okay. Well, while, while web discussion is, is ongoing, I just I had a comment that is maybe going to tie in um, the idea that uh, KI gives students the solution skill set they need to be solution integrators with the earlier comment about the difference between knowledge integration and transdisciplinarity. Um, I think of myself as a transdisciplinarian. Um, if that's a word. Um, but I think that, at least in my case, transdisciplinarity is something that you stumble upon because you realize you have multiple interests. Uh, whereas knowledge integration, there's a very uh, purposeful and sort of formalized process of trying to expose the students to these ideas at the times when they're forming their interests. And so for me, there's a, there's a purposefulness about KI. Intentionally bit, transdisciplinary yeah, inten as opposed yeah, to accidentally intentionally transdisciplinary. transdisciplinary. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps I'll just ask you to give a com comment from your experience in health informatics and knowledge integration. This is Danny Ho, Certainly. who's another right. Chad and Systems Connection. Class of 2002. So actually later on in that course, I also took um, user interface human factors and went to Maryland to sort of follow my wife there. <laughs> but over there, I straddled, again, Maryland Medical Center research with information systems uh, doctoral study. And for me, I was only comfortable doing the two at the same time. On one hand, it paid my tuition. But the other hand, really, is it would have been uh, perhaps too focused had I just done the studies and not seen the world of application. And had I just done the world of application, I might have missed out on the, the research approaches and methodologies that are also very useful for making long-lasting changes in application. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I felt. And so HI going forward for me is very exciting. And that's one reason why I moved back here, actually, to keep that sort of dream alive and vision. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Dr. Sloka. <laughs> Thanks. Scott's my name. Um, Scott. Very good. Uh, so um, I guess I can give an example. When I graduated, uh, when Ed was finished with me pulling his hair out, geez, is he going to leave yet? Uh, <laughs> I w went to work for a software company that developed uh, PAX systems for hospitals, radiology departments. And that particular type of um, uh, problem was uh, was complex in that it had to integrate technology, um, uh, image processing, display of images, an understanding of what the boundaries were, who the players were um, in, in the department, uh, uh, an understanding of uh, the technical constraints. How fast can you really send the images down uh, the pipe to various places? Can you get the images everywhere? What are the ethical considerations of 
giving images or uh, reports everywhere, can your passport protect them acceptably or not? So uh, that's just sort of one example of um, uh, multidisciplinary thinking in the health informatics field that, that, that I've been involved with. The others are um, uh, epidemiology. I was an epidemiologist in, in Newfoundland studying health information on uh, various neurological problems and, and um, uh, also did research in uh, uh, antibiotic resistance, which required uh, being able to understand uh, disease process and um, uh, drawing that information out of the databases that we had and, and things like that. So this, this is, it's important in uh, health information uh, to think of all the uh, uh, different disciplines uh, to integrate all that together. So that's all I have to say. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, those are excellent uh, examples and I think are very typical of, of what health informaticians uh, address on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, they have to address the concerns of the doctor, the other health practitioners, the patient, the, the uh, system that they're working in, the system being could be the department, not actually the information system, but uh, and so on and so forth, right up to uh, pay levels to the government. So there's so many different factors and groups of people that you have to interact with in terms of trying to solve some of these uh, important problems as we all get older, as we all need to uh, be able to live in, in as best uh, condition as we can. So uh, we see this talk that you've given today so very important in the thinking of what we need to do to engage our students um, learning about health informatics, it's very crucial to, to their knowledge and I hope actually <laughs> some of the students will consider some of the courses that you're giving. Um, taking your program, it would be a great way to start their uh, education down the path in terms of being a, a health informatician. So thank you so much for coming today. I've learned a lot and I'm sure the audience has learned too and enjoyed your presentation. So uh, let's give another round of applause to our speaker. I'm sure Ed would like to answer any questions that you might still have, and I hope you will come back to our next seminar on March 16th uh, on uh, independent living spaces. So thank you for coming today. Thanks very much.